Hello. Hello, how are you? Just, am I, can you hear me? Am I turned on yet? I'm not turned on. No, I may be in. No, I'm turned on. Definitely by you lot, because you've just been amazing. And Bridlington is so beautiful. It's my first time here. But I had a walk yesterday along the beach, and it's, it's so sandy. Sandy beach, wow. And lovely people. Delicious food, fish and chips last night. So, wow. very happy girl. Excellent. Am I sitting? Yeah, please take a seat. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming to see us all. I notice you have a fan too. Her fan will travel. I know, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing weather today. We've been really lucky this weekend. So I'm glad you've had a nice time so far in Bridlington. I've had a wonderful time. I've had a wonderful time. But I'm slightly sad for all the children that have gone back to school this week. Because they really haven't had a summer. No, I'm very, very sorry and sad for all the teachers yeah. as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> there are any teachers here today? I know, I know Michael is. He's helping me, so he's a, he's a teacher. So yes, I will come back to school. But, yeah. but it's beautiful, and this is this is a wonderful venue. Yes, it is. Isn't it? And they do have a lot of concerts here as well. Um, you know, a lot of musical acts have appeared here over the years. But that's a good place to start with you, isn't it? Because We've talked about this before, but you've got a bit of a well, you've got a bit of a musical background, but you've woven it out with some exciting musical projects. So you did <laughs> make some records, didn't you? I did. But when you say a lot of the musical background, well, not a lot. But oh, I don't know. You've, you've been, you've been in some exciting videos, haven't you? I've been in some, yeah, some really interesting videos. You've know, got to see. I don't turn my back on you. I got to work with some wonderful people. I worked with Adam Ant on the Goody Two Shoes. And um, that was fun. Yeah. Such a clever, clever chap. He story storyboarded everything beforehand so you knew exactly what we were going to do. And we had a director, Mike Mansfield. Mm -hmm. So we did that, and that was great fun to do. It took two days to shoot. And then I did um, had the great honor of biting meatloaf's neck. Wow. On a video called If You Really Want To. It's a good song, too. I mean, not a lot of people know it, but it's a really cool song. It's really good. Is that one of your highlights, Biting Meatloaf? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Wouldn't right. it be yours? Yeah, yeah I think it would probably be <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you also, you, you, did, you made a couple of records as well. I mean, I the, one, the first one you've done with Cream. Is I, that right? Is the back of And then you met with Gary Newman. I did actually. There's a there's a wonderful chap here who who, who does a Gary. I don't know if he's still here, but he dresses like Gary Newman and he looks like Gary a lot. Um, he was here earlier, so we had a nice chat. Yeah, I was lucky enough to. I was only 16 when I got to do the um, at Abbey. I got to record at Ab to London. Oh, there you are, Gary Newman. Yeah. It's Gary Newman. <laughs> I guess I couldn't see. There you are. Um, couldn't see for looking, but um, so yes, he travelled up and down on the train, and the gentleman, Steve, was head of Decca Records, and I was only 16 at the time, and I'd left school, I wasn't very good at school, I was very dyslexic, left school, and um, not sure what I wanted to do, I thought something to do with maybe art, and Steve said to my father, I sang in the choir, well, kind of sang in the choir, <laughs> a little bit in the church choir. And he said, do you think she'd be interested in doing a record? And my father said, oh, I really don't know. I, I shouldn't think so. She's very shy. Um, was incredibly shy. I still am, believe it or not. I talk a lot, but I'm quite shy. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he, he talked to me and he said, I think Steve talked to me. Dad's friend and said, I think it would be interesting for you to maybe do it. So it was written by um, a chap called Mark Works, who did Grocer Jack. I don't know a lot of people. You would know that, because you're a bit of a muser, aren't you, yourself? So he, so he was the producer, and they had already recorded the song at Abbey Road, and it was called Tar and Cement. And it was in 1966, I don't know, 67? I had not long left school. So I went into the studio and 
unbeknownst to me, they had this lovely track with these lovely musicians on the, in the background doing I, I didn't meet them at that time. And he said, oh, um, uh, it, so on the backing track was Eric Clapton, Steve Howells, Ginger Baker, and Jack Bruce. So that was my backing <laughs> band. <laughs> Not bad, is it? Which, which was pretty. So I had those, did the recording. Um, my father was waiting outside the uh, Abbey Road from the outside the studio. And um, he, I came outside having done the, done the song, Tar and Cement. And Dad said, I was just speaking to four really interesting musicians. They were in the other, you know, in the other studio. I said, oh, oh, Dad. He said, yes. He said, they sounded really good. And then I saw them disappearing. I said, Dad. Do you know who you were speaking to? I said, no. He's a solicitor, you know, a lawyer. So he'd have no idea, really. He'd been speaking to the Beatles, oh. my heroes at the time. So, um, yeah, I didn't meet them, sadly. No, but, that hey. been very so that was that. And then the other one, what did I do? Oh, the other one was Gary Newman. Yeah. Yes, it was Gary Newman. Gary, yeah. um, again, I got a call from my agent. Um, I don't know how that this happened, but he'd already recorded the song and it was called Pump Me Up, which is an interesting title. And um, I went to his studio in Shepparton, and it was Newmar Records at the time. I went and he recorded it. He'd done all this backing and all the stuff with, by himself with his band, you know, with, the, with his brother and his band and um, went in to record this. It was slightly, I don't know if you ever get a chance to listen to it, it's slightly too high for me because it was, it was put, you know, it was put in a certain key and he hadn't really heard me sing before. Maybe just as well, because he, he might not have asked me to do it. But I did it. And then you can hear him, if you listen to the record, you can hear him in the background. You know, you're adding some gravitas to the actual song. And on the other side, it was a song called The Picture, which is a really interesting song. He's a fabulous musician, Gary, and, um, and a really nice man. Lovely family, and, and a Gemma, and just a really family man. Very, yeah, so very when, modest, yeah. very modest and very sweet. When you, when you have this initial push with music at Abbey Road, uh, after you know, not being long out of school, how did that then evolve into you going into acting? Um, well, it, when I say I wanted to do art, that was what I felt was the only thing I could maybe do a little bit. I wasn't great, but I could draw a bit, paint a bit. And so I got into Brighton Art School for Saturdays. <clears throat> so I do a Saturday morning, do a life class there sometimes. Um, and it was through that that I met a or he came up to me, an art student friend who was studying photography and he said, could he take some photos of me? And I said, yes, if you want to, yes. I couldn't see why, but he did. So we took them in a place called, um, it was a manor house near Brighton, so we did it, Preston Manor, Preston Manor. Beautiful old house with lovely gardens and I remember he said, what, what are you going to wear? So I just wore very simple trousers, or slacks back in the day, and just simple jumper. No, a bare feet, because I always really like bare feet or boots. I'm a bare feet or boots girl. So did that. He, he, he quite liked the pictures, they were very nice actually, very simple, black and white. And then David Bailey, the photographer, was having a, a competition for a newspaper, the Evening News. And the photographer said, can I send, he asked my mum if he could send his photographs to the Evening News, to David Bailey, to, for the competition. So she said, yes, why not? Thinking, you know, we wouldn't hear anything back. But lo and behold, a few weeks ago, a few weeks later, um, they got back in touch and they said, David Bailey wants to, to... I, I became the face of the year in 1966. It's a hundred years ago, and I'm looking around before most of you were born, but hey, back in the day. So I, I was the face of 66 in the newspaper for, for one year. Yeah. So, so, 
And no money for a specific, well, many projects, but there's a specific set of films made by Hannah Holland. Now, yes. again, you've already mentioned the Beatles and Cream and David Bailey and Gary, <laughs> these are all very famous names, but as is the Hammer House of Horror, it's an yeah. absolutely famous set of films. They were, I mean, so much so. Do I, I hope I don't sound like I'm playing my own trumpet. Does that sound oh, like no, absolutely not. But, but these are amazing the stories. truth is they were there. Lovely, they <laughs> absolutely lovely. Everybody's got a story. All yeah. Of have a I'm going to tell everyone like. I've met you tomorrow. So oh, so nice. Likewise. Exactly. There we go. Um, yeah, so Hammer. Gosh. Hammer. I think I got the Hammer film. I got a contract with Hammer for one year, which was amazing. And it came about by, I'd done a poster campaign in England, and I actually went on to do it for four years with no contract. They just used to phone up and say, do you want to do another shoot? Um, and it was for Lands Navy Run. I don't know if any of you gentlemen or ladies have tried the run. I myself am not particularly keen, and I shouldn't say that, but, but it's all right. Um, my granny used to, I used to be given an honorary bottle after I dragged it through the water, through the sea, in many of the shoots. My granny, they said, you can take that home. So I took it home to my granny who would proceed to put it in trifles at Christmas. And because she was a bit short-sighted, she used to put rather a lot. <laughs> and they were very strong. But, um, but so I wasn't a huge fan, but I shouldn't say that. But the campaign was good. And the, uh, the boss, the head of Hammer um, Films, Sir James Delores at the time, they, what I did was they had big, huge posters, big billboards all over the place, all over England. And, the Hammer man, James Carreras, had seen the posters because he used to live in Brighton. He'd seen them on the train travelling up and down. And apparently, he'd said, oh, I'd like to see the girl in my office. That sounds really strange, doesn't it? It actually wasn't. He was very nice. <laughs> and I did go to his office. I think my mum was waiting outside, but I did go to his office. Met him, and I did a screen test for them. And then they offered me a contract for a year, and I did the two films, Dracula and Andy, and Captain Cronus. So very lucky. They were fabulous. Very lovely family. Hey, someone else I've been lucky enough to meet uh, at a lecture he gave was Ray Harryhausen. Oh. Now, Ray Harryhausen, I don't know if you know the name, but you probably know the film. Things like Passion Titan, Jason the Argonauts, and of course, you were uh, in Golden Voyage. Golden Voyage Sinbad, Sinbad, which has just celebrated in Scotland. Last day, we had a celebration three weeks ago of 50 years of the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And Vanessa Harryhausen was there, his daughter. Sadly, Ray passed away 10 years ago, so he couldn't see what's about to happen to him in London too. We've got something really exciting. But uh, yes, so I went to Glasgow for that. They showed the film to an audience and the audience were wonderful. But there were a lot of young people watching it too. Um, of course, I was only 10 years old when we filmed uh, Simba. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> no, I was not 10. I would have been very precocious if I had been well, 10 years old. A lot of, a lot of actors who were in, you know, sci-fi and fantasy films now will talk about either it's fine acting to nothing or it's it's difficult acting to nothing, as if it's something new. But of course, back in the Ray Harryhausen films, you were acting with things that weren't there. Yeah, it, it, yes, it, there was nothing there. Because Ray was such an amazing, I call him the godfather of special effects, of stop motion photography, because he... He, he, he watched Willis O'Brien going way back to the original King Kong and he, he kind of helped him on that and he learned the stop motion effects watching Willis O'Brien. Um, so Ray was a master at that. But yes, you're working with nothing. So you're, well, but what did happen, what was the amazing thing was Ray was a wonderful artist and would show us these most beautiful drawings of the creatures we were to see and the caves we were to be in. And then you just have to become childlike and magic, which is, I think, I think for a lot of actors, I mean, 
This is me personally, but I feel, I don't know if John feels the same or Clive, but I feel to retain the inner child is really important because that's how we start off. It, it's very sad when one gets to the age of about 12 and then you almost forget how to play. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because I seem to forget, I seem to remember that when I was a little girl and I grew up, mum and dad, uh, but I was an only child. So I had, I had friends at school, but when I was on my own, I used to do the, you know, the play talking and the other people talking and me talking. Sounds a bit mad, but I'm sure we've all done that. You know, it made believe, basically. So in Roy's film, especially for certain scenes, it was a question of make believe. He'd show you the pictures of what he wanted, and he'd tell you what he, he wanted of you as an actor. And then you'd just do it to the best of your abilities. But uh, he, was, he was just an extraordinary man, a true, you know, he, he, he was a, I think now they're calling him the titan of cinema. You know, he certainly was. It's kind of a really apt uh, title for him. It was amazing. And so modest. I mean, the bigger they are, a lot of the big stars, a lot of the big directors, the bigger they are, the nicer they are. Because they've all, you know, they've all been there. They've all been at the low points, and then they get lucky or talented. It's usually through sheer talent that they come up and they... They're amazing. He was a wonderful man. And so we're honoring him in London at the Regent Street Cinema on the 29th of... Um, 29th of... September, so this month, 29th September, they're having a plaque to him actually put in the cinema, which was the first cinema, my daughter happens to work there, but it's the first um, cinema that the Lumia Brothers showed their famous train, if people know about the Lumia Brothers, the famous train scene. So it's still there, the cinema, and we're on a great, Vanessa is coming down um, from Glasgow, and we're going to be there to celebrate Ray. And show the film again and do a Q&A. So, yeah. um, no, you, you were talking there about um, keeping the inner child. Yes. So mm -hmm. how exciting and every night thrown out a simple rubbed into us. Uh, and we became like Testing. a club. Uh, and we were a really, really tight group. Uh, and uh, uh, it was fantastic. In fact, the people who weren't having their heads shaved every morning jealous of the, the wonderful uh, uh, atmosphere that we created in the makeup room. Uh, and it was David Fincher's first feature film, so he's gone on to uh, you know, several, several hit films after that. I was a 28 year old director, and he, uh, he was just fantastic and really, really uh, uh, wonderful. I had a, I had a, a picture taken when I was at drama school, so I had my show for, for a part and I just said to her mate just take a picture of me this might be useful for later on uh, and, and cut to 10 years later I've given it to my agent and she had it in the bottom drawer and they were looking for I think they said monks for this film and she said I'll, I'll just send this photo in general. and David Fincher put it on the uh, wall of the casting director's uh, uh, Get me 20 more like that. So that you know, just one picture were taken uh, in the 1980s, uh, the 1970s when I was a journalist, led to me getting a film back like that. It's fantastic. One of the other roles I really want to talk to you about. It's going to slightly on a tangent here because I've spoken to many people on this stage before, and the amount of them that have got an anecdote um, about. Tommy Cooper is unbelievable. Now, you played Tommy Cooper in a one-man show, and I believe, not only did you have to learn magic, but you had to do, learn to do magic for Tommy Cooper. Yeah, yeah well, in order to, because in order to portray a magician who's getting it wrong, you've got to know how to do it right. It's like Les Dawson playing the piano, you know, when he goes wrong, he's, he knows how to do it right, but, it, you know, it's the same thing. So a wonderful man called Jeffrey Durham, who was the great Soprendo, who was married at the time to Victoria Wood. He taught me all the magic. And uh, yes, off we went on tour. Uh, I think we did 100 shows in 70, 64 venues or something. And we did it at the Edinburgh Festival. 
and I've done it as an after dinner uh, you know, thing ever since. You know, it's just he made me beat with laughter, and it was it was joyous to stand on stage to, uh, doing his material as honestly and as faithfully as I could, and hearing the laughs of recognition in the audience because it was part of a lot of our childhoods. You know, uh, uh, that that uh, he, he showed and his. His act basically remained the same the whole of his life. Uh, he just did it in a slightly different order. And, <laughs> um, it, but it, it just, it still makes me weep with laughter. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I love doing it. And I appeared on a lot of the stages that he'd appeared on, uh, and that was a very special feeling. So I was using a lot of his props as well, so that was incredible. A lot of people are going to recognise you from casualty which is a very different Saturday night TV show to Robin of Sherwood. Um, again, looks very intense, lots of blood and trauma and stuff. I mean, was, was that very serious to film or? You see, I, I think it's a, a misconception that if you're filming something which is heavy or serious or you know, that you're bound to be walking around like that all the time. The truth is completely the opposite. You erupt from the, the uh, the studio into the, into the daylight, as it were, and you're having a laugh. You're having, you know, uh, you're having a laugh with a bunch of uh, 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 your fellow thespians. But actually, working on a comedy can be really quite difficult. And it can be everyone going around the room going, what's funny, what's funny? Think of a funny line for there, what can you do? And quite often, working on a comedy is not <laughs> the laugh that you think it would be. Uh, that's just the way of the world. Uh, but no casualty was, was great fun. It was a bit of a sausage machine, there's no doubt about it. We, uh, uh, you know, we were churning out episodes, but it was made with a lot of heart. It was made, uh, certainly when I started, it was made hoping that the, the NHS would be seen in the best possible light it could be and to reflect the amazing job that people who work in the NHS uh, are doing for us on our behalves day in, day out. Uh, we only tend to think about them when we need them, but they're doing it literally as we speak now. They're out there sorting people out and helping people. Were you ever mistaken for a genuine uh, health professional? Well, I, uh, well I, I, I got the part, and uh, uh, I, before I'd ever started filming, I was standing in uh, Superdrug, the chemist in, uh, in Bath, near where I live, and uh, um, someone collapsed in the queue in front of me. And before I knew it, I was taking two steps towards him, thinking I could help. And then I suddenly realised I didn't know what on earth to do. This was before I'd started filming. I was so embarrassed. Luckily, there was a first aider in the shop who helped. But I was so embarrassed that I made the cast do a thing called the French City Lifesaver, which is a course, literally two hours. And it, uh, this is 30-odd uh, years ago now. And uh, um, you, you literally learn to keep someone's uh, blood and oxygen circulating through their vital organs until the ambulance gets there with the life-saving drugs that can keep them going. And I still remember it today. Uh, the ABC of resuscitation, approach, assess, assist, airway, breathing, look, listen, feel, circulation, 215, 215. And if anyone collapsed here today, I could keep them going until the ambulance got here. Uh, and it really should be the first lesson every Monday morning in schools. And there, there could be no more important thing than learning how to keep someone alive. Uh, uh, for the once or twice in your life you might be confronted with a situation like that, or a family member, or child, whatever it is, to keep them going until the, they can get there with the life-saving drugs uh, is the most important thing we can all learn. I think. Um, now, many actors were lucky enough to find themselves in some very exotic locations when filming Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> how did you feel about not being in an exotic location, necessarily? Well, uh, as you know, with Game of Thrones, there's seven factions all fighting for the same throne. Some of them are filming in Malta, some of them are filming in Iceland, some of them are all over the place in exotic locations. I was in Belfast uh, uh, at minus 22, and the winter of 2010, I think it was, we filmed it. I've never been so cold in my life. 
Uh, I just got back from Everest. I've done a charity trek to Everest Base Camp, and the coldest it got there was minus 15. So it was seven degrees colder in Belfast than it was in Everest. Um, uh, and we filmed out on the Titanic dock, uh, uh, and it was a wind chill factor. Honestly, if, if poor actors, the things we do. Uh, but uh, no, it's, uh, my memories of Game of Thrones are being absolutely frozen, basically. Uh, but uh, none of us knew the phenomenon that it was going to become. None of us knew, uh, you know, it's literally changed television in a lot of respects. The first series, I think, cost $50 million, so 10 episodes, uh, in 2010, and every single one of those dollars was up there uh, on the screen. Uh, it certainly wasn't enough in our pockets, I know that. Uh, but it, uh, you know, I think the audience got their, uh, their money's worth. It was a fantastic uh, uh, feat, really. Uh, but all I remember is the cold. <laughs> um, now, you, you are on what, what must be one of the most repeated clips on TV. Um, I'm sure, you'll, if you don't know, you'll suddenly have one of those moments where you'll recognise Clive, because you were with Dawn French on the Victor of Bigley when she famously went chest deep into a puddle, was it? Oh, was she it? did, yes. She was eventually suspended by her armpits down, down in the hole. It was a glorious... Uh, it, 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 it's since become, you know, the, they call it the second funniest bit of, bit of television. After Del Boy falling through the bar in Only Fools and Horses, uh, they say that Dawn going into the puddle is the second funniest thing. Who, who ranks these things, I don't know. But uh, I know that it's had 20 million likes on a meme that went round last year or the year before. Uh, 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 but it was a glorious afternoon, an autumn afternoon in Buckinghamshire, and uh, Dawn did it twice. She was underdressed with a, uh, a wetsuit. They warmed the water slightly, they poured a few hot, ke uh, hot kettles of water in just before she went in. Um, and she did it once absolutely perfectly, and uh, there's always a sort of... Everyone looks around and says, well, you can't surely have got it on the first take. we better just do one more to make sure. And she did exactly the same thing, she obviously had to get changed and <laughs> sorted out again. But she did it again the second time. I think they probably used the first tape, I can't tell. All I remember is that everyone had been fussing around Dawn, obviously, because it was about her. And, um, and I, you know, I was part of that process, but I'd suddenly forgotten, oh no, what the hell do I do when she goes in the world? You know, and I can remember them calling for turnover and action, and they go, oh God, I haven't really worked out what I'm going to do when she goes in the puddle. So I ended up just going, and that's the only thing I could think of to do. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one option they were left with. Then. I've seen, if you Google the clip at the moment, it actually comes up, the sort of school kids have recreated it as well. That's, have that's online at the moment. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if they were recreating lots of famous comedy clips, but yeah, they've done that. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, it's social media and the whole uh, advance of things, you know, from when I was a young actor, it's just it, actually baffling. It's wonderful in many, many, many ways, but uh, you know, uh, it's lost me. I, I'm totally, totally uh, not, not at ease on, on that. So I wouldn't even know where to look for it. Really. Now, as well as uh, lots of photographs on your stall today, the project you've done, we haven't mentioned everything. There's a Sherlock, of course, and also you've got some books with you. You, you are an author. Yes, I'm a published author. Hurrah! It, um, uh, and uh, I mentioned Everest, and when um, the thing that happens when you go to somewhere like that, it takes such a long time. You have a long time in your head to think about things, to get things sorted out and in place. The only thing you can do when you're in, uh, that far away uh, uh, in that high altitude is keep warm, keep fed, keep watered, and look after the people around you, which gives you a lot of space in your head not to worry about car insurance, building insurance, uh, you know, tax delivery dates, all those things just are unimportant. And so again, I thought about uh, this idea came into my head, young boy gets world map for his 13th birthday, through which he can disappear to anywhere in history, 
at any time, at any time and any place. Uh, and I thought that's a that, you know that's a really good hook for a book. Uh, but it wasn't until many years later I was in South Africa on a on a long running thing, uh, and I had plenty of time downtime to to write. So uh, yeah. The, the, the Freddie Malone adventures were, were born. There's three published now, and uh, the first one's about Everest, second one's about King Tutankhamun, the third one's The Great Plague, Great Fire of London. I'm writing uh, um, uh, Pompeii and Vesuvius as we speak, and uh, um, the First World War will be book five. So he, can, he has his own adventure set in the actual real historical setting. It must be exciting to research as well. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it takes me about a year each time to research it properly, to soak up the period, and then work out how Freddie is go Freddie's story is going to weave in and out of the actual historically accurate uh, uh, facts. Yeah. Clive, it has been a joy yeah. meeting you and talking to you. Please, can you go and see Clive at his stand, look at his beautiful books and his photos? Um, can you give a big round of applause and thank Clive? Thank, thanks for coming, everybody. It was lovely to be here. Good old prediction. Okay, folks. Uh, coming up next is another drawing workshop, uh, and it is with our resident artist, Abby Stabby. And it'll be in 10 minutes' time. And if you want to learn to draw some amazing characters, let me tell you, she's working on her first comic at the moment, and she may well show you how to draw these characters. But one day, you might be cosplaying. Who knows? So please, come and get your paper, your pencils, we provide all that. We provide the comic book artist, it's absolutely free. Please come and sit yourselves down for what is usually a very popular workshop. So it'll be in about 10 minutes' time if you want to come and get comfy and we'll make sure you've got pencils, paper, etc.
Just a couple of minutes till uh, future legend, Abby Stabby, is on this stage drawing her characters uh, and showing you how to do it. If you want to come and learn how to draw her amazing characters, please do come and join us. Okay, folks, pencils at the ready. You are going to spend at least the next 20 minutes in the company of Abby Stabby. Oh, wow, that's a big. Oh, my God, that's loud. Hi, Abby. <laughs> Not too bad. Right then, the, the stage is all yours. Okay, right. Hi, everybody, how are we doing today? This is, this is really weird. I'm not used to wearing one of these. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to teach you how to draw my own character and my actual cat, his name's Norman. He's very simple, very easy to draw. I think everyone can have a good go at it. We'll do a few different expressions you can try out and then, you know, we can have some fun with it today. And once it's all done, feel free to come to my table upstairs and 
uh, grab a couple of free prints to show me your drawings, okay? Cool, awesome, right. Let's start off with a big circle. This is probably going to look very wonky. I'm not used to, usually used to drawing this big. <laughs> Can everybody see okay? Okay, and then we're going to have him looking straight forward, so we want to put a guideline down the middle, about here. Uh, let's see, and we're going to draw his standard grumpy face right now, so we can kind of have his head tilted down a little, so you want the guideline to be about, about a third of the way up maybe. Once you break it down into very simple shapes, it's, it's so much easier to do. Okay, and for the nose, we do a little upside down triangle like this. Okay. Fabulous. Right. And for the mouth, because we're going to make him look like extra, extra grumpy, we can exaggerate it a little. So we do a big line like this. And a big line like that. I'll pass you at half past. Half past yours is half past. I'll give this to you before you need it. I'm drawing it this at a really cool. Because he's a cat and he's a, he's a fluffy old man, we like to put some chubby cheeks 